10 minutes each. Now, the thing is, um, for the first talk, or should I say um, exchange, uh, there's going to be um, no questions. But at the end, I'm going to explain the procedure for questions. Just to cover it briefly, it's very important uh, to keep order in the room and that even if you do hear something that you don't like, it's important that you at least listen to the other person's viewpoint because um, inshallah that is the way the Prophet used to handle situations, difficult situations. He always listened to the other side and then he himself replied to that. Now we're going to have written questions because there's so many people here and no doubt there's so many questions. Many of them may be similar. So what we'll do is we'll group all the questions. Uh, there's paper all around the room on which you can um, write your questions. Anyway, um, Brother Shabir Ali, you have uh, 10 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On this topic of similarity and differences between Islam and Christianity, uh, I think most of us are familiar with the areas in which we have a similarity and the areas in which we differ. And after I begin by praising God, I'd like to give us a framework by which we can understand how to evaluate the reasons for the similarities and the differences, and how perhaps we can look at them from a different angle today. I begin, as I say, with the praise of God. I praise God, the maker of the heavens and the earth, and I send peace and salutations on his last and noble messenger. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we know that there are two main areas of differences between Islam and Christianity. One is the person of Christ. Who exactly was Jesus and what should we understand concerning him? And two, the concept of sin and atonement. How can we be put right with God? Now from these two concepts stem a number, number of related concepts as well. When we talk about the concept of Jesus, who exactly was this Christ, the concept of incarnation also comes about. Was he God in human form? <coughs> And for that matter, the concept of Trinity is also related. Is God one? Is he three? Is he three in one? Or how should we speak of God? Well, let me tackle the first uh, concept first. Uh, Christ. Who exactly was he? According to Muslim understanding, he was a man, a prophet, a messiah, a, me a worker of mighty miracles by the leave of God. In Christian understanding, he was a little bit more. A lot more. He was God in some way to be explained. What's the reason for this difference? I think there are primarily two principal reasons. One is that I believe that after Jesus and whom be peace was taken up by God, there came on the scene one man, St. Paul. He said that Jesus appeared to him in a vision and gave him a message to preach. St. Paul went straight away into the synagogue, according to Acts chapter 9, verse 20, and proclaimed that Jesus is the Son of God. According to the editors of the New American Bible, the St. Joseph Medium Size Edition, this is the only place in the Acts of the Apostles where someone uses the title Son of God to make this claim about Jesus. Another related reference is where Paul again was speaking in Acts chapter 13 and he quoted a passage from the Psalms, I would think quoted out of context, again to apply a title Son of God to Jesus. We find in the life of Paul what I would see a kind of deviation from the message of Jesus. That Jesus was taken to be a servant, a messenger of God, the Messiah. And in fact, when we read Acts of the Apostles, I'd like you to understand that the Bible is made up of a number of books. And one of the books is entitled Acts of the Apostles, about what we are speaking now. That book details the, the life and activity of the disciples of Jesus after Jesus had left the scene. And this gives us a snapshot picture of what happened over a 30-year period. Ladies and gentlemen, it is very interesting to note that over this 30-year period, it was not the disciples of Jesus, the original followers of his, who were preaching this doctrine about him, but it was a new man on the scene, St. Paul. And I believe that St. Paul is a reason for 
the important differences between Islam and Christianity. Now, the original disciples of Jesus were also going about preaching. In fact, Acts of the Apostles tells us in chapter 5, verse 41, that they never stopped going about preaching door to door that Jesus is the Messiah. They were preaching that Jesus is the Messiah, the very thing which Muslims believe today, and they believe that because of the authority of the Quran, which they believe to be the Word of God. But you see, the reason for the difference then is not the Quran, but the reason for the difference is St. Paul teaching a new doctrine. The other principal reason, as I said, has to do with the compilation and editing of the Bible. Once St. Paul had taught, it should be now clear to many students of the Bible that the writings of St. Paul were the earliest documents of the New Testament. Out of the 27 books that make up the New Testament section of the Bible, that whole section that deals with the life and work and teachings concerning Christ, out of that, St. Paul's writings were the earliest of the rest. Scholars believe he was writing around the year 50. Whereas the earliest of the four Gospels is the Gospel according to Mark written around the year 65 to 70 within that period of time. So the Gospel of Mark, the first of the four, came about 15 years after St. Paul had already been teaching his doctrine. And we see evidence in the Gospels and in many other passages of the New Testament we see evidence that some of the doctrines of St. Paul were being put into the text as though it used to be there prior. As if this was something really historically that happened in the life of Jesus. Let me explain. St. Paul did teach that Jesus is the Son of God. We find that many passages in the Gospels bear evidence that later scribes came in and tried to work the title Son of God into the text. Ladies and gentlemen, don't get me wrong. I'm not here to criticize the Bible, but I think as one of the speakers said here already, we need to look at the faith critically. We need to understand it. Both Muslims and Christians need to understand why they believe what they believe. And more importantly, should they continue to believe what they believe? What is that belief that God wants them to accept for the sake of their salvation? And this is why we're exploring this tonight, and this is why you have come, I hope. So now, to continue, we see evidence that the title Son of God was being put in where it did not belong. For example, in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verse 1, I notice somebody has got the New International Version Bible up there. If you look in the New International Version Bible, Mark, chapter 1, verse 1, it reads the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Ladies and gentlemen, right next to the title Son of God, there's a little footnote. If you go down to the bottom to check that footnote, it says that many ancient authorities and manuscripts do not have the title Son of God in that spot. And you know what happened? It was not there before, and someone came later on and put that title in when they were making a copy of the text. And so it reads now in our English translations. Some of the translators have gone a step further, being honest with themselves, they have deducted the title, the title Son of God from that particular verse thus reverting it back to where it was originally. But when it gets back to where it was originally, it comes to the Muslim message, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is called the Christ, which means Messiah in Hebrew, and Masih in Arabic, the very things which Muslims believe today, and what the earliest disciples of Jesus were preaching, as I've mentioned before. Furthermore, while we're with the New International Version Bible, I notice it's a popular one among you, Look for Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Acts chapter 8, verse 37 in the New International Version Bible. Now when you look for that verse, ladies and gentlemen, you'll find something interesting. You go to Acts chapter 8, you find verse number 36, you find verse number 38. But 37 is just a number with nothing else. And you wonder what happened to the words that used to be in that text. But you can see those words down at the bottom in the footnote again. What the, revi what the revisers have done here is that they've taken out the wording from that text. Because that text was found to be a later addition into the, the Acts of the Apostles. So now it has been moved down to a footnote to show that this is no longer a passage within the Bible. But, what did it used to say? It used to bear a confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Again, the revisers have discovered that scribes were later on working into the text 
the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. So I see these are t as two principal reasons. One is that St. Paul was teaching a new doctrine. And two, people were busy working into the text of the Bible, this new doctrine of St. Paul, as though that text had already been there. Now, there are certain things that cannot be revised in, out of the Bible now, because the difficulty is inherent. We find that in the original writing of the Gospels themselves, this problem remains. For example, in the Mark chapter 8, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Christ, period. You go to Matthew chapter 16, for the same story, Caesarea Philippi, the same occasion. There the confession is, you are the Christ, son of the living God. All the commentators I've been looking at, they say that this is Matthew's own addition into the text. That will not be revised out of the text because that indeed is Matthew's uh, version of the story. That will remain there. But as long as it remains there, what we need to do is we need to go to the earlier text. To Mark, in this case, and we get the Muslim message. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Is this? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Jay Smith, you've got 10 minutes. Thanks. I'm going to be talking fast, so I'm going to put an overhead on so you can follow what I'm saying, because I have a tendency. <laughs> Please don't spend all your time reading it. Listen to what I'm saying as well, but I'll try to follow this as much as I can. It has always been astounding to me that whenever I'm in, in class, and I've been in classes in um, London, in the United States, and in France, as you can tell, I'm from the United States, and I've been in many classes where I've been the only Christian in the class. Certainly, I've been in classes where there have been a lot of secular students, and I find myself when I get into discussions with other people that I'm always alone by myself. But that has not been the case whenever a Muslim has walked into the class. And it's been interesting to me to see how, whenever, especially I noticed this in France back in, in the 1980s when I was there, Whenever a Muslim would come into the class, suddenly I found that I had an ally, I had a friend, because many of the same things that we were talking about, many of the same things that we're dealing with in today's society, many of the problems with the moral issue and certainly what's happening in the secular world, the Muslims and the Christians stand side by side. And it's been great to, to have that type of relationship with Muslim brothers, and it's been great to have that relationship uh, not only on the university campuses, but also uh, in other areas uh, of London, and certainly what we're doing now at Hyde Park Corner down there in London uh, at the Speaker's Corner. But certainly we do have those similarities. Some of the similarities that Shabbita was talking about, the fact that we do believe in one God, the fact that we have a similar history, the fact that we do have many of the same prophets, we also look to the same scriptures. Many, much of our moral teaching is the same and our volition. You can see that up there on the, on the screen. But there are differences. There are differences. And I, what I'd like to do now is just to go through quickly what these differences are. But what I want to do is to focus in why is it that we have these differences and where did it all begin. I think it's important that we need to look back at where it all, was, uh, where it all started. And to do that, I think we need to go right back to the very beginning. We need to go back to the Garden of Eden. We need to go back to what was happening there in the Garden of Eden, because we both have that story in our scriptures. The Muslims, you have your, that story in Surah 2, also Surah 7 and Surah 20. We have it in Genesis 2 and 3. And when you look back at that story, you will find that there is Adam and Eve in a garden. According to Islam, the garden is not on earth, it's somewhere else, it's above the earth. According to Christianity, the Garden of Eden does exist here on earth. But the vast difference between the two stories, between the Christian and the Muslim story, really can be found in two small insignificant verses in chapter 3 of Genesis, which you don't have in your Quran. Let me read them to you. Chapter 8 and 9 of Genesis 3 says, Then the man and his wife, referring to Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man, Where are you? This doesn't exist in the Quran. Now, do you see the significance and why I'm pointing to these two verses? It's very important that you do. Because from these two, voice, from these two verses, I feel we, you, can, you can put together many of the, the problems that we have with Islam concerning who God is, who we are, where we're heading, where we've come from, and what we're doing right now. If you look at these two verses, what do you know? First of all, you see that there was God walking and talking in the garden. God, the infinite God, the transcendent God, and according to Islam, God is transcendent. We also believe that God is transcendent. But according to Islam, God does not walk and talk with his creation. Here is God walking and talking with his creation. He is limiting himself and coming down. Now from that point, can you see why is it we're talking right past each other? Why is it we don't understand each other? Can you understand now the significance of why I bring that out? It's very important that you do. Here is the infinite God, the omnipotent God, omniscient God, 
The God who has created the heavens and the stars, who limits himself and comes down to walk and talk with his creation. Calling out to Adam, where are you? Why did he have to call out to Adam, where are you? He knew where Adam was. That says something about our God. That says something that I don't see anywhere in Islam. There is God in relationship with his creation that is unique to the Bible. God in relationship to his, to his creation. Now, from that, you can see why is it that Islam cannot understand why God would come again. If he, but if you, were, if you had those two verses, if only you had that part of the story, if only you had that in your Quran, I don't know why it's not there. You can see now why is it that you're still looking and why is it you do not understand what we're talking about when we're talking about atonement. You do not understand what we're talking about when we're talking about sin. Because there was God in relationship with his creation. There was God walking and talking with Adam and something had gone wrong. Adam wasn't there. He ought to call out to Adam, where are you? Now just go down through these different areas, not because we only have 10 minutes, this could take an hour to try to explain. But let me just zip through them real quickly so you can try to follow me what I'm saying. God, first of all, limits himself. He, he's in relationship with his creation. We give the name to God. We have a name that does not, does not exist in, 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 in the Arabic language. It doesn't even exist in your Quran. And it's Yahweh. And right through the Old Testament, 6,823 times, you will see this is God's personal name. This is the name that he, gives to, he gave to Moses. When Moses says, who should I sell, say, say sent me? He said, my name is Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton. In, in Greek, in the New Testament, we give the name Abba. Abba is the name that is given, given to him. That means father. Here is God who is like a father. What does that mean about us? We are like his children. Now, can you understand? Why is it you don't understand what we're talking about? God, who treats us like children. That relationship that we had with God at the very beginning is the relationship that God had intended from the very beginning and something has gone wrong. And we're going to talk about that in the next section. Now, do you, all under, do you not understand then why is it it's so important that God had to come down and to not only walk and talk with us back there in the, in the Garden of Eden, but did so 2,000 years ago. It's not a problem for us. We have no difficulty with the incarnation because we understand God did it back then. He can certainly do it now. He can certainly do it, have done it 2,000 years ago. In fact, we have many instances in our scriptures where God did walk and actually talk. He did so with Abraham before he, before, as, an, as he came down in the image of an, of an angel before he went down to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He did with Moses there at the burning bush. You've got the same story. That was God who came and talked to Moses. He's done so a number of times. We call them theophanies. That's the name we give to them. And he also did so 2,000 years ago. I've had many Muslims who say, how could God become a man? It's impossible. It's anathema to think of God becoming a man. Folks, it's not difficult because you're limiting God if you don't believe he can become a man. If God can do anything, certainly he can become a man. It's, the question is not how can God become a man, why did he become a man? That's the real question. Why did he become a man? Very important. The reason God became a man is because something went wrong. Something went wrong in the Garden of Eden and that says something about us, humanity. According to Islam, humanity, humans are nothing more than creatures. They are nothing more than God's creation. They are like slaves to the master. According to the Bible, humanity is put on a much higher pedestal. We are not just slaves to Matthew, we, we are his children. We are given a special status. We are loved by God. Now, do you understand why, why it's so important that we, need to, that we need to look and compare? And you need to go back to the Garden of Eden to understand that. You need to go back to the Garden of Eden. Humanity is made in God's image, therefore we have all the rights. We have all the rights. God has the rights to choose, so do we have the rights to choose. That means we can reject that relationship. Now that's the other side of it. We have the freedom to reject the relationship. Now this is where we're starting to head to, and this is what you see that the significance of what happened back there in the Garden of Eden. We're going to talk about it next time. I won't get into much to that. But also then we need to talk about revelation. Let's go into that. We're just kind of skipping through these real quick. I wish I had more time to explain them, to flesh them out. But if you look at the revelation that we have, and you see the revelation of Islam, the revelation of Islam really comes down to God who cannot have any communication with his, really have any relationship with his humans, therefore must use intermediaries. He used prophets, nabis, who he, I'm sorry, um, rasuls. He uses prophets to, to speak through, to get the message out to his people. Now that works fine, and we have the same thing in the Old Testament. You see many rasul, many prophets who were sent down to communicate God's message to them. But if you're going to communicate to, to somebody, what's the best way to do it? Is it to send an emissary? Is it to send an ambassador? Is it to send a prophet? No, it's to come yourself. The best and best way to come and communicate to somebody is to do it yourself, is it not? That's why I'm not here. That's why I'm here. I could have sent a tape recorder. I could have sent an emissary to come up and, and tell you and read my notes. But no, I'm here because I should be here. Otherwise, you're not going to understand and really understand what I'm talking about. And that's what we see God doing, not only back in the Garden of Eden, not only back with Abraham, and not only with Moses, but also 2,000 years ago. 
But the interesting thing is we don't stop there because not only did God communicate through the prophets, not only did he come 2,000 years ago, Revelation personified, but he's continually to reveal himself to us. He's continually in, in relationship with us because of the Holy Spirit, which he gave back after he left and went up to him. He promised there in John 14 and John 16, revealed in John 1, 8. Thank you. Moving on, I'll skip over a few places. Then you can understand then why prayer is so different and so important to us. Prayer for Islam, when I, when I go and I pray with my Muslim brothers, I realize the same prayers over and over again, memorized prayers. I don't do this when I talk to my wife. I don't say the same thing over and over again. When I talk to my wife, I'm in a relationship with my wife, I want to make sure she understands what's going on. If there's a crisis, I, want to, I need to talk about it. And that's what we do with God. We talk to him and we, and we expect a response in return. That's what God, who's in relationship with his creation, would expect of us. But then let's get back to the, last, the very last part, paradise. In Islam, paradise is like a garden. It's a garden with trees and rivers, fruits. I would expect that to be a, a garden, that they, that would be a paradise in the Arabian context. There are women there, hoodies. I don't, I'm not sure who they are. I'm not sure where they've come from, but they're, they're waiting upon the men. But nowhere do I see in the paradise of Islam, God, their relationship with his people. Okay, thank you. That's it. We'll continue next time. <laughs> Brother Shabir, you have five minutes. Okay. Better run up there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Let's take the last point first. Is there God in paradise? Well, in Muslim understanding, as we read uh, both in the Quran and in the Hadith, the Muslim believers will have a relationship with God in paradise. They will be able to see their Lord. And this is something I'm sure that uh, Mr. Smith should have been familiar with from his study of Islam. It is something very commonly uh, found in the Hadith of Bukhari and uh, many passages in the Quran. But uh, I'm, let me take the bottom up first, the last things which were mentioned. Now, prayer for Muslims. We repeat certain things. This is true. But the Muslim also has many optional prayers, and he has the opportunity to raise his hand in supplication to God, and he has the opportunity to speak to God in any circumstance, anywhere. So the Muslim has the fixed ritual prayers, which indeed is repetitive, but the Muslim also has the optional prayer and voluntary supplication, which he can do at any time, and that could be very spontaneous. So I don't see what's wrong with repetition. Uh, talking about speaking to our spouses, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how many times I must have said to my wife, honey, I love you. <laughs> and I don't know how many times in the future I will repeat that. But uh, in addition to that, we do have other conversations too. <laughs> now, in Christianity, God came himself. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the problem that we're dealing with. The idea that God came himself in Christianity, this is the idea that was being put into the Bible. You look again at 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. That verse used to say that God became manifest in the flesh. But the revisers realized that somebody had made a slight addition just by putting one stroke on a letter, had changed it from he became manifest to God became manifest. And what that text now says in your New International Version Bible is that great is the mystery of godliness. He became manifest in the flesh. So that does not say that God became manifest in the flesh anymore. So what we're dealing with here is a new idea that is being foisted into the Bible. The Christian is a child of God. The Muslim is a slave of God. Well then, why is Moses being called a servant of God in the Bible? Why is Jesus called a servant of God? The very thing that Muslims pride themselves, when a Muslim says, I am Abdullah, I am a slave of God, the very thing is called of both Moses and Jesus, two of the most principal persons in the Bible. You want to know where to find it? Acts chapter 3, verse 13, in reference to Jesus. He's called a servant of God. Acts chapter 4, verse 25 servant of God. Many places in the Bible Jesus is called servant of God. If Jesus is a servant of God, I'm happy also to be a servant of God. Now the fire. God appeared to Moses in the fire, we are told, but there's some difference of opinion concerning this in the Bible itself. Because if you read Acts chapter 7 verse 30, you will see that Stephen, explaining this incident, he said that it was an angel who appeared to Moses, not God. Because as Stephen will continue to explain in the same chapter, chapter 7 of Acts, God is unlimited. God will not be limited in this particular way. He does not dwell in, in physical places. Now, God is Father. God is Father. You see, folks, when you say something about God, you have to watch you don't put unnecessary limitations in, on God. Today, people are asking the question, why don't we speak of God as Mother? 
or just make it neutral, God as parent, and say our parent, or our God, Father in heaven, and, and that sort of thing. When you speak of God as Father, somebody says, well, why not the other thing? You're limiting God, and God should not be limited. But is there a basis in the Bible for limiting God? Does God actually come down the way the Bible describes? Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible does in fact describe that. But this points actually to a misunderstanding of the ancient Hebrew writers of the Bible. They conceived of God as some kind of superman way up in the sky somewhere, looking like a human being. This is why in, in Exodus chapter 31 verse 17, it says there that God rested on the seventh day and then he was refreshed. That's what it used to say in the King James Bible, but some people found that difficult to stomach and so they have revised it. How does God rest and become refreshed? But this is how the Israelites perceived of it. What do you understand when you read Exodus chapter 4 verse 24? And it says that Yahweh met Moses on the way and kept looking for a way to kill him. Is that God limiting himself or is this some conception of God which does not gel with the later teachings which we will hear from Jesus and whom be peace? But I don't have time to go into that now. I thank you very much. Okay. It's good to see somebody from the Muslim side to who uh, takes uh, the time to look at our scriptures and to go through and try to find philological arguments. I commend you. Very well done. And I, was, I, I heard you also when you did the debate on the Trinity, and I was fascinated to see what you've done with it. It's great that we're having this type of discussion, because it's important that we are and we do hear what the other side is saying and the impressions that are coming across to them. Shabit has mentioned a number of times that uh, this idea that Jesus was not the Son of God, that this appellation, that this, uh, this um, uh, let me get my Bible while I'm talking about it, this idea that Jesus was uh, the Son of God is something that came much later, or it, came, it, it was uh, invented or created by Paul and then redacted back by the later writers, uh, the later disciples, who uh, then somehow concocted or certainly agreed with Paul and then, of course, created a, divin a divine character for Paul. Now, I'm going to be talking in the, next, in the next speak about some of the manuscript evidence that we do have for some of the earliest writings, so I won't get into that here. But there are many places where Jesus does confer a, a divinity upon himself where he talks and he refers to himself as the Son of God. And I'm just going to uh, offer some to you. Uh, we, uh, they're not in Paul's writing. These are all in Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John in the Gospels. Let me just share some with you. Let's start with Matthew, since that's the very beginning. Matthew 27. If you have a chance, write these down. Those of you who have pens and papers, you can read it when you get home. Uh, I assume that you have Bibles. If you don't, go out and get one. It's well worth reading. Matthew 27, verse 20, uh, 54. <laughs> When the centurion and those who were with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. This is an appellation that's given by someone from outside. Matthew, Mark. Look at Mark uh, 4.22. Matthew 27, verse 24. I'm sorry, I've got the wrong reference. Let's look at Luke 9.35. I've got the wrong one, that one. Luke 9.35. This is the transfiguration when Jesus was, uh, went up to the top of the mountain and when God came down. And he says, as the voice came from the, from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. This is God himself speaking, referring to Jesus as his son. <coughs> Continuing on with uh, John. And, and keep your finger open to John because there's an enormous amount of verses here that we could go through. John 5.18. I was just kind of scratching these out as Shabid was talking. John 5.18, which says... But he was even calling, even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God, as the Jews were saying this about Jesus. And then continue on down through 21 and 23, where Jesus says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives, it, gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. And then he continues that, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Continuing on to verse 23. Where it says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words, this is Jesus speaking, and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will, be not, and, and will be condemned and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from life to death. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Jesus is referring to himself a number of times as the Son of God. John 10, 36, continuing on down uh, the next few chapters. Even earlier than that, he says, I and the Father are one, in verse 30. In verse 33, he says, reply, uh, 
that the Jews were replying to him and says, for blasphemy, we're not stoning you for blasphemy, but because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And then verse down 36, what about the one whom the Father set apart at his very own? I am God's son, he says. Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? I think there are plenty of other references. If I had more time, I could pick them all out and share them with you. From the Gospels themselves, referring to the fact that Jesus himself called himself the son of God. This is not something that Paul invented. This is not something that came much later on. This is something that we can read in the Gospels themselves. Thanks a lot. Now, continuing on to another area. What do we know about Paul's writing? And of course, do we believe that it's the first, it, it, that it is the first uh, of the documents that were written? We're going to talk about a little bit more about some of the document analysis that we have today and some of the manuscript analysis in the next section. Certainly what we are now finding out is using forensic evidence and using manuscript evidence, we are now finding some of the earliest fragments of the papyri and some of them which can now, using forensic evidence, can be traced back to 60 AD. And when we read that, one of them in particular is the Modlin Manuscript, which is right here in Oxford University, in Modlin College. You can go to see it for yourself. And here is a document that it was using forensic evidence has been dated to 60 AD, 38 years from Christ's death. And what does it say in that fragment? It says, Jesus is curious, Jesus as Lord in the Greek. We need to be careful that we, that we don't try to put together 2,000 years later some type of scenario of Paul and the others who wrote much later and had it redacted back because the manuscript evidence just doesn't support it. Okay. Welcome. As uh, uh, hello, right, as promised, um, I'll just explain the uh, questions procedure. There'll be people walking up and down the aisles, right, um, just collecting all the paper, and they'll be distributing more paper. And what you do is you write um, your question on that paper. Um, I mean, what we're going to do is we're just going to have written questions, and uh, if they uh, if we run out of written questions, then you'll have a chance to stand up and ask questions. Um, Okay, right, um, could we just have some order please in the room? Could everyone just sit down in their places? Um, there's still two more talks to go. Okay, thank you people. Jay Smith is now going to start on the next subject, which is the nature of sin. You've got ten minutes again, Sue. Thanks. Here we go again. Sin, does it exist? There's an awful lot for there you to, for you to read. Certainly, if you, if you want to get a hold of it, we're going to give you an uh, email, I'm not a uh, network number, it's on a website. All this material is going up on our website, and you can uh, pull it down from there at your own leisure. It'll be written and out, it won't be just note form like this. What about sin? Again, again, in order to understand about sin, we need to go back to the Garden of Eden again. We need to go back to where it began. We need to go back to what was happening back there at the Garden of Eden. Both our scriptures talk about it, therefore I think it's a great place for us to start. It's a good place because we have that bridge with Muslims. We can go back and see that there's a commonality in Surah 2, Surah 7, and Surah 20, Bible. We see it in Genesis 2 and 3. In the Quran, sin, from, what I, from, I, from talking to Muslims and what I understand, is that sin is merely a disobedience. It was a, Adam sinned and he sinned for himself alone. He was forgiven and then he was banished from the earth. Uh, from, 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 uh, the Garden of Eden. And the question I always ask is, why was he banished if he was forgiven? Something's wrong there. It does not make sense if Adam was there in the Garden of Eden, he sinned, God forgave him, Allah forgave him, and then he had to be banished from the Garden of Eden. Now why did he have to leave? What was going on there? Well, I think the, re the answer to that is in the, is in the Genesis account. First of all, you have to understand that there, as we said earlier, I don't believe that there was a relationship. And we know that there was no relationship in the Quranic text of between God and man, between God and Adam there in the Garden of Eden. Thus, there was not much significant loss. Nothing was really significant in the breaking, or you might say, in the sin that happened there when they ate the fruit. No corruption. According to many Muslims, it was just, it was really a seduction by Satan that caused Adam to do that sin. Now, in the biblical account, the scenario is completely different. Here is God and man, God and Adam, in perfect relationship. Man and Adam in perfect relationship with his God, in perfect relationship with his wife. They were naked, they didn't even know they were late naked. The Quranic text also talks about this. Adam in perfect relationship with the, with the surrounding around him, including the animals, including the plants. There was nothing wrong. It was a perfect existence. And then they ate of that fruit. Suddenly an imperfection came into the whole atmosphere. 
They knew that they, something had gone wrong because they, suddenly they had to go look for leaves to put on their bodies. They realized they were naked. They knew something was wrong because when God was walking and talking, they hid from him behind the tree. You have that account, so do we have that account. But it does not make sense in the Quranic account. Why did they hide? Certainly they felt guilty. And God called out to them, where are you? Enormous, enormous significance in that. Now why is that? Well, because God is pure and holy. We see that in Psalm 77. We see that also in Psalm 99. He cannot live with sin in his presence. We see that in Habakkuk 1.13. God cannot have that impurity in his presence. He cannot have sin before him. Therefore, there are consequences to sin. There are enormous consequences, and not something that can be just lightly said, you're forgiven and that's it. There are enormous consequences, and it's the consequences that we see are something that God has stipulated, and it is God who stipulated that he cannot have sin in his presence. Therefore, by his stipulation, the, the punishment for sin is death, complete death. For any sin is death. We see that in Ezekiel 18.20 and also Romans 6.23. Thus they who knew, who were now in sin had to be removed from him who knew no sin. They lost life, health, vitality, peace, joy, safety, and happiness. And it just didn't just affect them, it affected all of humanity. You see that if you read through the chapter 3 of, of Genesis, you'll see that it was from that time that women started bearing with children with, and having pain in their childbirth. It was from that time that we, we see that weeds came about, thorns came into the earth. It was at that time that death was introduced into life. Atonement needed to make. I'm sorry. Atonement needed to be made. Atonement means making amends. We see this in Leviticus 4. In fact, 79 times we find atonement throughout the Old Testament, once in the New Testament. Sin separates. Atonement had to be to given. In other words, there had to be a buying back. There had to be a return back to that former presence. Now, man couldn't do that because in order to atone, he would have to die. Uh, five minutes? Thank you. That's a little bit better. I was going to get a little, I was little antsy there when he said 30 seconds. In order for him to get back in relation to the God, he would have to die because that is what the punishment for sin is. The punishment for sin, according to God's parameters, is death. And right through the Old Testament, if you look, you will see that over and over again, you will see God who has demanded a sacrifice, a shedding of blood. We see it right through the Levitical laws. We can start with Abraham. What did God demand of Abraham? He demanded a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. It couldn't be just any sacrifice. It had to be a shedding of blood in order to, for man to be resolved of that sin. But that wasn't the perfect sacrifice. Well, if you look and you understand, you ask the Jews, what kind of sacrifice were they to get? They were to get an unblemished lamb. You Muslims have the same law. You must look for an unblemished lamb. Why an unblemished lamb? Because that's for pointing forward, that's prefiguring the perfect lamb that was going to come, the perfect sacrifice that was going to come in Jesus Christ on the cross. It's how it already happened, folk. it happened, hey, folks. It happened 2,000 years ago. That's why we no longer sacrifice lambs. That's why we don't have to participate in Eid. We've already had that sacrifice once and for all. And that sacrifice that we see in Jesus Christ on the cross, and it's right through the New Testament, it's right there in the Gospels, it's there in Paul's writing. When you look at the atonement there that Jesus Christ came to do, God himself had to come and take upon him his own shoulders our sin. We could not do it because we would deserve death, we would all die. But if God came to take on that price, if God came himself to take on that sin on his shoulders, only then would the punishment be paid. Now, both we and Muslims, both of us agree that justice needs to be done. When there is a sin, there has to be justice. Justice is getting what we deserve. We deserve to die. We all deserve to die. We see that right through the scriptures. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Now, this Islam offers, they offer, offer mercy, mercy, but that is unjust because the sin has not been paid for. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. God, by His grace, paid that price. This we don't deserve. That's why the enormity of the atonement is, is so significant for us today as Christians. What we see happen 2,000 years ago is enormously significant because God, that shows the ultimate, uh, the ultimate sacrifice, God Himself coming and paying that price for us. Now, Muslims say that God should not die. It shows an inadequacy of God, something went wrong with his plan. But I say, wait a minute. There's nothing that's wrong with God's plan because God gave us the right to, to, to sin. God gave us the possibility to sin because we are made in his image. The fact that we did sin and the fact that we can't pay for the, fa for the, for the sin that was there means that we've got to lay ourselves on God say, God, help us here. We can't do it ourselves. And this is what Christ did. God did in the form of, uh, of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. The cross fulfills the price of sin, death, providing atonement for those, those who acknowledge it, those who accept what happened back then. Let me just read the conclusion. 
For Islam, sin or wrongdoing stands at the periphery of its teaching. Islam means submission to the will of Allah. The problem of past sin is resolved in present obedience to Allah's will, nothing more. This is because there is no intimate relationship between Allah and his creatures. He stands far above all human relationships or association. And is concerned only with his will being perfectly obeyed in his world. For Christianity, sin is a central part of its teaching. The gospel is centered upon the radical remedy for sin, which is focused on the birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. The problem of past sin, supremely Adam's sin, can never be resolved by any amount of good behavior now. We don't believe that you can ever get back into that relationship with God just by doing good things. Certainly we are required to do good things, but that is not going to take care of the sin that, between us and God. And, so, and, and, we're gonna, and I can talk about that in length of this. Why is it we do good things? Because of the fact that once we have acknowledged what Christ did on the cross, the Holy Spirit now can fix us and make sure that we are in relationship. And once you are in relationship with God, you will do good things. And that's the great thing about it. We no longer are controlled by sin. Now that we have God who is there showing us and leading us and making sure that we don't stay in sin. The damage is done, the divorce has taken place. It happened back there, the Garden of Eden. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a list of laws, but an offer to repair the relationship broken in Eden and fully repaired almost 2,000 years ago. Because of the cross, we can look forward once again to be walking and talking with God, as Adam and Eve did so long ago. Paradise loss will soon be regained. And this is what I want to talk about the last section. Paradise. Paradise is what we're all heading towards. That which God had intended back in Eden with Adam and Eve and got broken and, be, and, was, and, uh, and you might say got impaired because of that sin of eating the fruit. That relationship that was lost back then has been corrected on the cross 2,000 years ago. But the great thing, folks, is we can look forward to being back in the new Eden, you might say. The new Jerusalem. Being back walking and talking with God there in paradise. That's what we're all looking forward. I'm not looking forward for a garden with lots of women to take care of me. What I'm looking forward to is to be walking, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that glibly, but what I'm looking forward to is to be walking and talking with God again, just like it was back there in Eden. That which was lost back in Eden has finally been repaired, and I know that that's what I'm looking forward. Now, that I don't see in Islam. I don't know where you're heading towards, but it's not back to relationship with God again. And that's what I crave for you all. You've got to look at the cross and realize that only because of what Jesus did in the cross do you have a chance for the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Brother Shabir, you have 10 minutes. Folks, we meet again. <laughs> now, in Judaism, sin is not a big problem. Sin is there. It must be taken care of. But the Jews were reading the Bible for 4,000 years. And what they understood from the Bible was that God put Adam and Eve in the garden and told him to eat from any tree except from the one forbidden tree. But the serpent came and convinced the woman and then she went and betrayed her husband. She convinced him and they both ate from the tree. And as a result of that, now God cursed the woman. God said, you shall forever bear children through suffering in childbirth. But still your desire will be for your husband and he will master over you. And for the man, he said, because you, because you did listen to your wife and, and ate from the tree, uh, please, uh, I, I don't mean to be funny, but uh, I, I'm, you know, we're speaking about scripture, so we have to have some uh, decorum. Now, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, you shall forever toil for your living and you'll have to gather your food from among thorns and thistles. And uh, Smith was right. That's how come, the, according to the Bible, the thorns and, and the grass started to grow, weeds. And then for the serpent, who uh, obviously the devil was in the form of a serpent here, speaking to the woman and speaking to the woman and speaking to the man. So God spoke to the serpent saying, as a punishment for you, because you deceived Eve, you will now have to crawl on your belly and eat dust. So that was taken care of. It is true that initially, according to the book of Genesis, God had said to Adam, the day you eat from the tree, you will surely die. Uh, but the Jews understood that Adam didn't really die. What God did was gave him a lesser punishment. God could have killed him because that's the maximum. It's like you get a speed, you know, you have a, a speeding fine. Uh, you can always go to the court and perhaps get that reduced. I don't know if you do that sort of thing in Britain, but we do it in Canada all of the time. <laughs> You get a speeding ticket for $40 and you go to the court and you plead, you know, my wife was pregnant and she was at the hospital and I was, you tell some sort of lie and then you get it reduced to 20 bucks. <laughs> so the maximum penalty is there, 
but the system can be merciful and reduce that penalty. It seems that what has happened here is that uh, God has reduced the penalty. This is how the Jews had uh, understood it. I'm not saying anybody should go about in line courts now. <laughs> So for the Jews, what they had to do for their own sin is that was the question. It was not a problem of some original sin that they inherited from Adam. There was no such concept in, among their community. None of the prophets spoke about that. What the prophets told them to do was uh, to repair their own selves with God by getting a contrite heart and a humble spirit. And for the things that they did wrong, in order to uh, reconcile themselves to God, they were to seek forgiveness. And every year they had what they call the atonement ritual. On the Day of Atonement, Aaron the High Priest would take two uh, lambs and uh, he would slaughter one, slaughter one of them and use the blood for his atonement rituals between him and God for the rest of his community. And then the book of Leviticus says that Aaron must then take his hands and place his hands on the head of the live lamb. And this, I think it was actually goat, not lamb. That's why we get the, the word scape goat from. So according to the book of Leviticus, Aaron must now put all of the sins of the entire community on the head of this goat and send it off into the desert. And that one goes to the devil. So in this way, I don't know why it goes to the devil, but this is what the text says, that this is what happens. In this way, the text says emphatically, the Israelites will be purged of all of their sins. And they were doing this every year, they had no difficulty with sin. They could have continued doing that, and then we have no need for the Son of God to die. Because God was taking care of sin in this particular way. Now. The Muslims came along and they also have no problem with sin. It's not a big problem. It is something to be dealt with. It shouldn't be taken lightly. It is a serious matter. But God shows us in the Quran that Adam and Eve were there in the garden. They sinned. Not that the serpent went to Eve and then to Adam, but that Satan, the devil, approached them both and convinced them both. They ate from the tree. They both fell. God then banished them from the garden. Why banish them from the garden? This was a test for them to be placed in the garden to show them what will happen. Because now they're being prepared to go and live on the earth. The earth is the eventual place where God has designated for human beings to live. But he kept them in the garden for a while to show them what will happen when the devil comes to them. The devil will trick them. And they have to be ever on the watch out for the devil here on the earth. I hope some of you are looking. Now, what did God do with Adam and the fact that he sinned and Eve and the fact that she sinned? God taught them how to pray for forgiveness, saying, Our Lord, we have surely wronged our souls, and if you do not forgive us and have mercy on us, then surely we are the losers. Some of the Muslims still make this prayer today on a regular basis. Rabbana dhalamna anfusana wa illam taghfilana, and you know the rest of it. Now, so the sin is dealt with in a very easy manner because we're dealing with a merciful God. Yes, he is graceful to us. He gives us the grace that we do not deserve. We do not deserve to be forgiven. But He knows that He created us weak. He knows that we are prone to sin. He gave us that possibility. And He is willing if we turn back to Him to forgive us when we do. And this is how He deals with sin. What we have in Adam then, in the Muslim understanding, is not some original sin that gets transferred on to the rest of the generations for which we are forever guilty and for which the Son of God Himself has to die. But we have here an original lesson. You might even see an original blessing because, see, God taught Adam and Eve how to live on the earth and to be watchful for the devil. And surely the devil will trick us from time to time. He also taught Adam and Eve how to repair their relationship with God, how to turn back to him with a contrite heart and beg for his forgiveness. And he assures us that once you do that, he will always forgive because he loses nothing. He can forgive again and again. In Arabic, he's called Tawab, which means the one who forgives again and again. He's called Ghaffar, again with a similar uh, meaning. But in Christianity, it has become a problem. Why has it become a problem? Again, I don't know if I should blame St. Paul. Maybe, you know, this might be coming down too hard on the guy. But unfortunately, again, you see, often when the concept of sin is explained, it, reference will be made to the book of Romans. Who wrote the book of Romans? St. Paul. Reference will be made to the Corinthians. First and Second Corinthians. Who wrote that? St. Paul. It's often with reference to the writings of St. Paul that the sin concept can be explained in Christianity because he reinterpreted Genesis. He said that because the man sinned, he must die and somebody has got to die. And because of him, sin entered the world, death entered the world. And through another man, Jesus, now the process will be re reversed. What St. Paul did actually was he worked backwards from the cross. He took the cross as something to for granted, that Jesus died on the cross. Then he had to explain to the Jews why Jesus had to die on the cross. 
The Jews expected a Messiah. Their scriptures told them that the Messiah would be a victorious being, a victorious person. They could not understand that this Messiah would be crucified on the cross. And so when they heard that Jesus was crucified, they said, no, he can't be the Messiah who was foretold in the Old Testament. So Paul now, to get out of this problem, he said, well, you know what? There is a reason why the Messiah had to die. Yes, he said, you see, the one who is hung on a cross, according to the Jewish scriptures, he is an accursed person. Here Paul misunderstood because what the Jews were reading in the scriptures is that the one who is put on the cross because he committed a crime worthy of death, he is accursed. He is the cursed person in the eyes of God. But can you tell me, ladies and gentlemen, that the innocent person who was hanged for no sin of his own, that he will be a curse before God? But this is what Paul said to the people, that Jesus had become a curse for us. Your scripture said, you know, the one on the cross is a curse. Yes, Jesus became the curse for us. Well, how did that happen? Jesus took the sin of the world upon himself. And here you will find also, you know, the reading back into the Gospels. Yes, indeed, you will find these ideas in the Gospels as well. Don't forget, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all were written after St. Paul. And the farther into the future they were written, for example, John, the last of the four Gospels to be written, the more changes you find there in the story. All of a sudden in John's Gospel, John the Baptist declares Jesus to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, where did this story come from? You read Mark. You find any such thing that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Did John the Baptist say that? No. In Matthew, John the Baptist could not even know that Jesus had this identity because in Matthew chapter 11, uh, John the Baptist had sent his disciples to find out if Jesus really is the one who is to come or shall we wait for another. He did not know Jesus' true identity. But still in the Gospel of Matthew, there is an addition there in chapter in chapter 3 uh, of Matthew, the scholars say that an exchange there between Jesus and John was constructed by Matthew in order to get over a certain problem. I don't have time to go into the details of that. So you have a reading back into the Gospels of the story the way it was developed by Paul. But the simple explanation for sin and how to get rid of it is that which was there in the Jewish understanding and now finally in the Muslim understanding. Christianity somehow has deviated from that chain of transmission of the monotheistic faith and it is because again, unfortunately, St. Paul, I'm sorry to say. I hope that you will uh, pay attention to this and do your own studies and come to your own conclusions, folks. I thank you very much. Thank you, Shabita was saying that, um, and, he, and he's correct, that uh, they're in the, um, the old, the Jewish view. They uh, put their sins on a goat, they put their hands on the goat's head, and they, they put, let the goat walk out into the desert. And this was a means of uh, transferring their sin onto the goat. But what he didn't realize, and I think what he, what he needs to be careful of, is that prefigured exactly what was to happen. That also showed that there needed to be something, there needed to be an action, there needed to be something, there needed to be a sacrifice that... That, substi that substituted the sin of the person. On top of that, you say, he said that the goat was taking care, I mean the goat in, in going off the desert took care of that sin. It did, never did take care of that sin completely. It was prefiguring the, the, the final sacrifice, the final lamb of God that was going to come to take away the sins of the world. Just refer back to, uh, over to Romans 3.25. If you'll bear with me, if I can open up to it and just refer and read to it real quickly. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just in the one who justifies the man who has faith in Jesus. Who are those that he's referring to in, in verse 25 here? The sins are committed beforehand unpunished. Of course he's referring to those, the Jews as well, those who came long before the cross. Sins both before and after, that includes our sins as well. Now, if I took a, if I stole a pencil from you, Shabia, or anybody else in this room, that's sin, is it not? I get guilty, I feel bad about it, I give back the pencil to you. Is our relationship repaired? Okay, our relationship is repaired. What happens, though, if I, if I take a, a pen from Shabir? Certainly, there is an impingement, on our, or there is a, a, an impairment of our relationship, he and I. But in every sin that I do, even taking something as simple as a pencil for him, 
There's also a vertical relationship that has been impaired as well. It's not just horizontal. Have I got the right? Is it horizontal this way? Yes, yeah, horizontal this way. <laughs> there's, an, there's a vertical relationship between me and God because every sin I do, and this is what we see scriptures referring to. Isaiah 59 2 says that all sins re ruin, ruins the relationship that we have with God, our Father. Any sin ruins that relationship with God. Now, how is it we're going to repair that relationship with God? It's no good for me to say I can take back and give back the pen to, to Shabit and say it's all been taken care of. That sin with God has not been repaired yet. So, and what does God say? Now, God is the one who demands a sin sacrifice. It's not me saying it. It's not the Christian church saying it. It's not the Jews saying it. We didn't create these parameters. It's God who makes these parameters. God demands that there has to be a shedding of blood. It says that in, in, in uh, uh, Romans 6, 20, 23. It says that also in Hebrews 9, 22. For without a shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. There has to be a sacrifice. There has to be a repairing of that sacrifice, of that relationship that was impaired in our sinning. And that we only see on Jesus, uh, Jesus doing 2,000 years ago on the cross. And I think the reason why uh, uh, Muslims have a difficulty with, all, with, with this theology of atonement and why they have a difficulty and they want to place it on Paul and they want to say that Paul wrote before uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. It's amazing to me how we suddenly in the, in the year 2000 know exactly when Paul wrote and we exactly know when Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were, wrote. Certainly we know that Matthew wrote to the Jewish uh, to the people who are the Jewish people. And so therefore we know that he wrote, we're using a lot of terminology that was, that was uh, garnered for the Jewish congregation. And we know that Luke wrote for the more secular crowd. And I think when, what we're doing is we're trying to impose upon that somehow that he might have got this from Paul. When we know that, all the, the, that as they were writing, Paul and also Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that they were writing as a community because they were the eyewitnesses to these events. They were the ones who heard what Jesus said. They were the ones who knew Paul wasn't there. He was not a eyewitness to these events. He did not hear the sayings of Jesus. If anything, he got it from them. Luke as well. What does Luke say in the very first chapter? He says, Luke, in the first, very first verse, he said, listen, talking to the disciples, everything that I have said, I'm not an eyewitness, you are. Check out what I'm saying. He challenges them to say, to, say, to, 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 to come back on him if he got it wrong. He's talking to the disciples. They were the ones who were listening to Jesus, everything he, had, he said. Paul came much, much later. To say that Paul created this and the disciples gave up their lives, every one of them were martyred for what they said, except for one, except for John. They all were martyred for something that they didn't believe in, something that didn't happen, something that was fictitious, that was made up of a man that was, had been persecuting them at one time and now suddenly joined their group later on. Oh boy, okay, well I've got to keep stuff there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about sin, there are two types of sin as is described in the Islamic uh, traditions. One is the sin against the human being, and the other is a sin against God. Now, we understand that when we sin against God, the way to repair that is to ask God for forgiveness. When we sin against a human being, the way to repair that is to repay the human being and also to seek forgiveness from God so that we have both the uh, horizontal and the vertical uh, ways of dealing with it. But what we do understand is that against God, there is no price to pay. Against another human being, yes, we pay the human being. I stole your five pounds, I have to repay your five pounds. I stole your pencil, and Mr. Smith, I have to return your pencil, but I also have to seek forgiveness from God to repair my relationship both with you and with God. But what divides us now between Muslims and Christians is not this, as we see we understand the same thing here. What divides us is someone claims that there has to be a price paid to God somehow. And this divides us, because I can't understand it, why a price has to be paid to God. You see, Jesus, in whom be peace, told people how to pray according to the Gospels. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on, up to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Or, according to another reading, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Well, now, if you understand it this way, how do we forgive people who are indebted to us? Do we ask that somebody else has to pay it for us to forgive? I'll give an example now. Somebody sins against me, all right? Suppose now I have, um, you know, uh, Joseph in an angry moment, you know, comes up and punches me in the face. All right. Now, you might say he sinned against me or didn't sin against me, depending on your point of view. Let's assume that's a sin against me. 
So now, in, in the next moment, he, you know, he relents and he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to Shabir, but something you said there, you know, caught me the wrong way and, uh, you know, okay, can we do something about that? Now, I have a choice. I can say, no, I can't let it be. I'm going to punch you back in the face. All right? But if I'm a gracious person, I will say, Joseph, it's all right. You know, don't worry. Between two friends, what's a punch in the face? You know, let it go. <laughs> now, if I forgive him that way, you might say, you know, Shabir is a really honorable man. I won't forgive. <laughs> but now, suppose I say, Suppose I say, well, Joseph, you know, I'd really like to forgive you, my friend. You know, I know you're sorry. You didn't mean to do it. I'd really like to forgive you. I love you. But the only way I can forgive you is if, you know, Martin pays the price. So I've got to punch him in the face. <laughs> you know, you see, folks, it doesn't work. If someone else pays the price, that means there's no forgiveness. Forgive us as we forgive those who are indebted to us. You owe me five pounds. And you come to me and say, Shabir, I know you owe you the five pounds, but you know, I lost my job. I don't have it. You know, can we do something? I, you know, I can say I forgive you. Never mind the five pounds. Five pounds between two friends. What's that? You know, let it go. That's called forgiveness. Folks, if I say, oh, I really want to forgive you. But the only way I can forgive you is if someone else pays. <laughs> you see, folks, it doesn't work, you know, because that way I still get my fat payment and somebody else suffers. Some innocent person who didn't have to pay. So we say when there is a sin for forgiveness, nobody pays the price. The idea that blood has to be paid, this again, where is it referred to? Book of Romans, book of Hebrews. Hebrews says that without the, for the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Who wrote Hebrews? Many have said St. Paul for many centuries. Nowadays, it is doubted whether it is he that actually wrote it or somebody from his school. But in any case, it, it reflects some of his ideas. But did you know, folks, that according to Leviticus chapter 5, verse 12, it shows that a person can get forgiveness by offering a flower sacrifice, and no blood, and that person, God says, will be forgiven. So somehow Paul misinterpreted the Old Testament. Yes, it is usually the case that a blood sacrifice was required, but not always. It is possible to get forgiveness without a blood sacrifice. This is what Paul didn't notice, obviously, in Leviticus chapter 5, verse 12. And what's more, uh, folks, you know the early Christians kept offering the blood sacrifices in the temple at Jerusalem. The reason they stopped is not because... Christ brought them a new teaching. The reason they stopped making the sacrifices is because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Forty years after Jesus, the temple was destroyed. If you read Acts of the Apostles, you see that the disciples were still making sacrifices there. And even St. Paul himself, when he came to Jerusalem, was under the scrutiny of the original disciples. He also made sacrifices. Read Acts chapter 21. I thank you very much. <coughs> Yeah. All right, now we come into the true heart of the debate. Namely, what is it about Christianity which separates it from Islam, which makes it more relevant to you and me here on the university campus that's right here and now? In other words, if I'm to accept Christianity, how do I know it is true? If you're to accept Islam, how do I know it is true? <coughs> it seems that depending on my background or cultural taste, I will either accept or reject the claims of us for the authenticity of either Islam or Christianity. Those of you who are Muslim will not accept my conclusions, no matter how well I present them. And the same can be said of the Christians toward Mr. Ali's presentation. We have all come with our minds made up, so how then can we really know which is true and relevant for the student world today? What criteria is there for ascertaining which religion is true? Is it merely a matter of subjective faith claims, or is there a means by which we can really know? I believe there is. Because I've seen many people come to Christ, myself included, by means of a rational and critical assessment of its validity. Religion by its very nature primarily posits doctrines and faith claims which cannot be tested. But religious literature, the Quran and the Bible for instance, were not written and compiled in a vacuum but were created at a specific time and in a specific locale. The stories they recount touch on peoples, places and events which can be verified by scientific analysis to test for historical accuracy. Once they have proven to be historically accurate, then their claims can begin to be held credible as well. It is primary by this means of historical verification that we can hope to influence not only the skeptical, non-believing, secular world, but give credence to our claim that Christianity or Islam is thus relevant to the student world today. A world which is dominated by secular thinking, critical of anything which speaks of God or miracles or even a notion of creation or the final days. I believe that the Bible is historically accurate on those points where it touches history. I can be critically it can be critically analyzed and proven credible where it touches people's places and events. Therefore, to begin my talk, let me start at that point and assess its historical qualifications. Here we go again. 
just look at those real quickly. You can see there's not enough in 10 minutes to get all through all this, but let me try to hammer it out a few uh, significant areas. One of the criticisms that has been given to the Bible is that our manuscripts are not authentic because they are too old. They are too late, written too much after the originals. And also, since they're so late, we, do, we cannot therefore know whether or not that which we have in the manuscripts, that which we have in the copies, uh, are, can be um, relevant to the originals which were written by the, the Gospel writers and Paul and others, certainly the, with the Old Testament. Let me just look at, look, take a look at this graph here. What I want to do is do a comparison now of the manuscript evidence that we have for the Bible. First of all, as you can see right there in uh, point number one, we have an enormous amount of wealth of manuscript evidence for our scriptures. We have 5,300 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. We have another 10,000 uh, Latin Vulgates. We have another 9,300. In, in other words, we have 24,000 manuscripts of the New Testament predating the Quran, before the Quran. There is no other piece of literature that has that mass of manuscript evidence or documentary evidence to corroborate it. Now you may say they're all very late. Let's look at this other graph down here. Just compare it with some secular documents that we, that we all know of. Uh, Herodotus, Thessalides, Aristotle, Caesar, Pliny, Suetonius, Tacitus. These are all well-known historians and, and philosophers. Look at when they wrote. Some of them wrote 4, 480 BC, all the way up to 100 AD. You can see the list up there on the left. What are the earliest copies that we have of any of these writings? Herodotus, 900 AD, is the earliest copy we have of his. Thucydides, 900 AD. Aristotle, 1100 AD. In fact, the earliest copy we have of any of these writers, these historians, who none of us have any problems with, is 850 AD. Now look at the biblical text down here, the manuscripts. They were all written within the first century. I disagree with, with Shabir. I don't believe that they were written as late as 80 and 90. And I'll, that's a whole other debate we can get into. And how is it we can date these manuscripts? A lot of it can be done by using historical analysis. But look at when they were written in the first century. And look at when the copies that we have. 130 AD, 120, uh, 200, up to 400 AD with the uh, Codex Alexandrinus and the Saniaticus right here in the British Museum. Now, folks, these are from, 400, from 100 to 400 years after the original dates. The earliest that we can find for, uh, uh, for one of the secular documents is 750 years to 1,300 years after the originals. Why is it we having such a problem with the biblical manuscripts? They are by far the old, er, oldest and they are the closest to the events. That's a real problem because people do have not looking at the statistics. They're not looking at the dates. But there's other areas that we can look at. We can look at the hostile witnesses, the men that were writing at that time to corroborate what was happening. Thallus, who's a Greek historian, he wrote in 52 AD. He talks about the crucifixion. He talks about the fact that it went uh, dark at night, uh, echoing what we see in the scriptures. Tacitus, a Roman historian, writing in 80, 80, 80 to 84 AD. He talks about the death of Jesus. He talks about th that it happened during the reign of Tiberius. And he talks about Pilus Pilus. Now, these are things that we can read about in Luke 3, 1 and uh, verse 1. Josephus, the Hebrew historian in, in Rome, writing in 90 to 95 AD, he talks about the death of Jesus, the death of James, the death of John the Baptist. These were hostile historians. They did not care for the Christians. They would not have said these things to help the Christians out, but yet they corroborate what we see in Scripture. Going on down with Suetonius and Pliny the Younger, find it interesting that Pliny the Younger, a Roman uh, author and administrator in 112 AD, not only talked about the Christian community there, but he also referred to them that they were singing hymns as if to a god, cor corroborating what we see in Scripture. But we not only have that because Christianity from the very beginning was a missionary religion. Right from the very beginning, we knew that the early church fathers knew that it was to be taken, this message was to be taken out to the whole world. And they translated the scriptures, those letters and those gospels into many different languages. In fact, we have eight, uh, the documentation from eight different languages. I've got them listed up there. 15,000 different translations in eight different languages. Latin, Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, Gothic, Georgian, Ethiopic, Nubian. If we were to corrupt these scriptures, we'd have to go back through all those different translations and, and change every one of them. Can you see the enormity of the type of task you're asking for? We also have another 2,135 lectionaries which speak and, and refer to the scriptures and, and quote from the scriptures from, before, from the 6th century. But probably the most corroborated evidence we have is, are the early church fathers. These early church fathers, they took and they quoted from the scriptures, right, left, and center. Look at their writings. What they have done is they have found 86,000 of their quotes, but 32,000 of them from three, before three, 300 A.D. In fact, what we can do is we can throw away all the 24,000 New Testament manuscripts. We can throw them all away and just look at the early church fathers and we can reproduce the entire New Testament just from their letters except for 11 verses. Folks, if that's not corroboration, I don't know what it is. And I hear Muslims all the time saying that we don't have the proof. We don't have the manuscript evidence. Look, folks, there it is right up there. There's all kinds of evidence for our New Testament. There is no other book that has this type of evidence. But that's not all. Let's look what the archaeologists are saying. I can't quote them because I don't have time here. Do you want to see the paper? The enormous, just the support that the archaeologists are giving to us. But let's look at, at some of the things that they have pulled out. Let me just throw this through you real quickly. 
Many people have said that there is not any support for the patriarchal times. We have enormous amount of support for the patriarchal times now because we've come across four different genres of tablets. There's the uh, Amarna tablets, which are in Egypt, the Ebla tablets, which come from Syria. 17,000 tablets that have now been uncovered that corroborate what we read about in the Genesis account. Even to the extent that there is one tablet that has been found in Syria. These are, these are secular tablets. These are not religious tablets. These are secular tablets that talks about the names of the five cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebulun, and Zor, the five cities that, that Abraham went and defeated to help Lot in the order that we see them in Genesis 14.8. That's how specific these tablets are and how they corroborate our own scriptures. You can go right down. The Ebla tablets also talk about, tell, uh, talk about the Deuteronomic law code that we see there in Deuteronomy 22. The Amarna tablets from Egypt, they mention the name Hebrew, Ebru, the Abru. It's the first place where you see the name Abraham there. The Mari tablets, they mention Ariok. The Nuzi tablets, which come out of Iraq, they talk about six different customs that we can read about there in Genesis. But let's not stop there. Let's talk about the New Testament. If you want to talk about the New Testament, you've got to go to Luke. Why? Because Luke was a historian. If you read the book of Luke, if you read the book of Acts, he talks about places, names, and events. It's brilliant to see that. And I think the Lord gave us a man like Luke, knowing that we were going to have this argument, knowing we we're going to have this discussion in the 20th century, knowing that we we're going to have to corroborate our scriptures historically, because here he's got it. And the great thing about Luke is everything he has said has now, not everything, I'm sorry, be careful, I'm getting a little too excited, but the things that he talks about, the names and places and events are now being corroborated by the historical, the historical evidence that's coming up. Many people thought that he was wrong in uh, talking about Gallio as a proconsul. Why? Because Pliny never talked about Gallio as a proconsul until we came across the Adelphi inscription, which is dated to 52 AD. And what does it say? It says Galli was a proconsul. There he was, right there in white and white, and he was a proconsul for one year in one year alone. Now what does that tell us about the book of Acts? Because that's what we read in, in Acts 18.12, that Galli was a proconsul. That means whoever wrote the book of Acts, we know it was Luke, but whoever wrote the book of Acts had to be an eyewitness to the account and not somebody like Pliny who wrote, uh, wrote 50 to, to 60 years later. It had to be somebody who was right there, an eyewitness to the account. And we now know that it was 52 years AD. We even know when it was written. Now, if that's not corroboration, I don't know. And I don't know what you're going to do with that, Shabir, because that throws out your whole possibility of Paul writing so much later, or so much earlier, excuse me. There's just one evidence after another. But one, some of the most important evidence I think that I'd like to share with you today is the fact that it has an enormous amount of circulation. The fact that the Bible has now been translated into over a thousand languages. And it's been translated, a new translation is coming out every two weeks. A new one is beginning every 10 days. In 60 years, the entire world, the entire language that we now know, language that we have today, will have the Bible in, this, in their own languages. In another 60 years. Right now, 93% of the world can, can read the Bible in their own native tongue. But look at its life-changing power. Look what it does. We now have about 138,000 Protestant missionaries around the world. 3,500 new churches are being built every year. I mean, sorry, every week. Yet even more impressive figure, which reveals as a result of their efforts, 70,000 people receive Christ daily because of the truth that they see in the scriptures. Okay. That's it. I'm getting tired just going back and forth. The exercise must be a little bit uh, beneficial, something I've been waiting for maybe. Folks, when we come to this last segment now of our, of our debate between Smith and I, I think we're dealing with the more crucial segment now. This is a time of decision making. You've heard the arguments back and forth. We've spoken to you several times. And now you must be thinking. You are students, you are thinking people. And I think that for re religion to commend itself to you, religion has to be reasonable. Faith has to be reasonable. And what we've been saying tonight is that if we look at the doctrines that has to be believed, we talked about the two things that separate Christianity from Islam, the two crucial matters. The person of Christ and this question of atonement. If these are the two crucial matters, well then, we should try to now look at it from the perspective of the reasonableness of the faith. Is it reasonable to have it the way Muslims have, have it, that there is only one God and Jesus is the servant of God, that he's the messenger, that he is the Christ, the anointed one of God? So far, I have not found anyone that says that this is unreasonable. And if there's something unreasonable about having a man as Christ, as Messiah, as servant of God, and as his prophet and messenger, we would like to hear what this is. So, so far it looks that there's no difficulty there from the point of view of reason. When we go to the other side of the picture though, enormous difficulties open up themselves. 
You see, if you say that Jesus, this man, was also God, then difficulties arise. If he was God, who was he praying to when he prayed? When the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 26, verse 39, says he fell on his uh, knees, fell on his face, rather, and prayed. Gospel of Luke says he fell on his knees and prayed. Gospel of John says he looked up into the heavens and prayed. Who was he praying to if he was God? When he was on the cross, according to the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? My God, my God, why has you forsaken me? Who was he calling out to if he was God? Then, if, if, he has, if there's another one who is God, and he is also God, do you now have two gods? It's not new questions. These are the questions that raged in debates throughout the history of Christianity. Now, do you have two gods, or are they somehow one God? And if they're one God, what is the relationship between them, and how come they're one God? Are they co-equal? Many people will say, yes, they are co-equal. But according to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 28, he said, the Father is greater than I. So how do you work this into it? So now if the Father is greater than He, they can't be co-equal. And if they're not co-equal, then you have a greater God and a lesser God. This was the position of Arius back in the 4th century. So these are the difficulties you have. Now if you say that Jesus is God, you know, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Remember how we said that people went about fixing the Bible to make sure these beliefs get into there? Read First John chapter 5, verse 7. In the New International Version, that used to say at one time that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You know, folks, if you look for 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, you'll find the verse there, but you won't find those words. You'll find that there are three that bear record on, on earth, yes, the water, the Spirit, and the blood. But where is the three that bear record in heaven? That's not an original part of the Bible. You see what happens? People went into the Bible and fixed something there, and as older manuscripts of the Bible are discovered... These mistakes get uncovered and they have to be corrected. And I trust that as more and more discoveries will be made in the future, more things will be uncovered and more changes will be required in the Bible. Folks, the other question is the question of Jesus' own person. If he was God, what was the relationship between God and Jesus in the person of this man that we see? What about the humanity in him? The church has long held that Christ was completely human in every respect apart from sin. <coughs> in every respect apart from sin. And so, a, a clergyman from the Anglican Church who lives in my city in Toronto, his name is Tom Harper, he raises an interesting question. He says we should think about this carefully. If Jesus was a man in every respect apart from sin, did he, as a man, experience any changes in any parts of his body during the night, as most men do? So these are the kinds of questions that, you, that, that trouble the mind if you start to think of Jesus as God. Did Jesus have a human soul? Then if he had a human soul, then he, he had the human body, he had the human soul, he had the human mind. Well then, that looks like God is just dwelling inside this body. That means God did not become man. Why did God have to become man? We're told because God had to die on the cross in order to save humankind. This brings us to the other question about this salvation process. But then if you say God died on the cross, then who was running the world in the three days that God remained dead? These are the difficulties that are posed, you see. So what usually happens is that someone says to me, well, you see, God had to become man because, you see, the sin, God, you know, to get rid of sin, God alone had to die. And so God came down on the earth. He took human form in order to go on the cross and die to save humankind. And then I say, brother, brother, so if God died, who was running the world? He says, no, 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 you see, he died as a human being. I said, well, okay, well then, he was not God who died. So why did you tell me that God had to come down and die? God didn't have to come down and die. A man had to die, is what you're coming to now. He says, no, 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 he was God who came down to die. You see, only we go back and forth. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the things that you have to look at. You're students, and you're accustomed to thinking in every field of study. And when it comes to faith, the questions will be raised. Why did God have to do it in this particular way? Ladies and gentlemen, is it mercy? Is it justice? Neither. If God wants to be merciful, God will be merciful the way He's merciful in the Jewish tradition. 
He blots out the iniquities of the people. He says, I will remember your sins no more. He says, I will not punish the child for the sin of his father. I will not punish the father for the sin of his child. The righteousness of the righteous man will be his own. And the sinfulness of the sinful man will be his own. Ezekiel chapter 18, read the whole chapter. The people were saying, our fathers did something wrong and that's why we are punishing. They said, our fathers ate sour grapes and our teeth are on edge. And in Ezekiel chapter 18, God says, you should not speak like that. That's wrong. I will not punish the innocent person. That's what God tells us. This is the reasonable faith that's understood in Judaism, that's understood also in Islam. Christianity has something different because St. Paul introduced this idea. St. Paul actually called this foolishness. He knew that this was a problem for people. He said, I preach Christ crucified. That is my gospel. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, I preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. He says, the Greeks are seeking wisdom, but I preach to them this, what he calls, or what they see as foolishness. Paul realized that there's a problem preaching this, that this is not a reasonable faith. Folks, now we have this difficulty that we can reconstruct, but there's only so much we can do. When we go back into the New Testament writings, we see often that the, the writings are heading in a certain direction in order to promote that faith which St. Paul has built. If you look in the Gospels and see that from earliest to the latest, you find that the latest you go, the more of St. Paul's teaching is there. In the Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, for example, Jesus was teaching about the kingdom. In Matthew, kingdom is mentioned 47 times. Mark 18, Luke 37, John only 5. Why this reduction in the teaching about the kingdom? The later the Gospel, the less of Jesus' original teaching. But then in the Gospel of John, Jesus preaches a lot about himself. I am this great. I am the Father I want. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why only in John do you find these statements? How many times does Jesus refer to himself as in, the, in the Gospel of Matthew as I? 17 times in Matthew. 9 in Mark. 10 in Luke. You know how many times in John? 118 times. Saying, I am this. I am that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread. I am the good shepherd. And so on. You see, there's a developed teaching. The, the later the gospel, the more of that you find in it. And that cannot be recovered by manuscript study. This is just the study of comparative between the gospels themselves. where We, we recover that the faith has developed like this. Ladies and gentlemen, if you study, the more far the back you go on the historical uh, study, then you realize that the original faith was the Muslim faith. My final words are, praise be to God, Lord of the worlds. Well, I think we've heard a lot today about Paul. I think we've heard a lot about the gospel. I think we've heard a lot about Christianity. I've heard very little about Islam. I thought it'd be nice, Shabir, if you could have given a, us a, a defense of Islam because I've heard nothing on Islam today, really defending it. And I think we need to ask Muslims. One of the things that we're asking not only you, but we're asking the Muslim world, what is it that you have that can attract us? It's nice to talk in, uh, about theology. It's nice to talk about who the personhood of Jesus Christ is. I think it's important. This is close to our hearts. But we also need to ask, the, the world is also waiting out there to look and see what is it that Islam can offer them? What is it that Islam can offer the students here? in Manchester University or in any other university what is it there that you can that you can where is the lifeline that you have for us show us a model of Islam today where is it I've asked many Muslim students show me where Islam is being used where it's being where it's being a uh, model where it's where I can look to know what it will be like to be a Muslim to see a Muslim nation and they say we can't every place that I mention is it Saudi Arabia is it Pakistan no they're they're ruled by corrupted people if only they would be Muslims, suddenly everything would fall into line. There'd be no more corruption. There'd be no more poverty. There'd be this, that, and the other. And I say, listen, this is not a Christian country here. But there's something unique about Britain. There's something unique about the West, and that is it's built on Judeo-Christian principles. It's built on biblical principles. Even though it does not claim to be Christians, and a vast majority of people who, go, who live in this country no longer go to church, I think only 7% of the people go to the church anymore in this country. Yet the laws and the institutions that build this country, that make it strong, and that attract so many of you to come here, are built on those very biblical principles that I do not see Islam at all evoking. Why is it that so many Muslims come to this country? Why do they come to the West? What is it about the freedoms they see here? What is it about the attraction of the West? 
that makes it uniquely uniquely different than what they have in their own home host countries. And I say, what it is, it's biblical principles. These very principles that you're castigating, these very principles that you seem to fe see, seem to be so illogical are built on a context, are built on an example of God himself. God who came and sacrificed himself. Those same principles are ev evoked right across that which we see built, built in to what makes this country so great. That idea of sacrifice. That idea of sacrificing myself, my time, my energy for someone else. That idea of the knowing that God, through the Holy Spirit, is, putting, is, 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 is directing how I'm to act. Now, it's difficult to put that down in black and white. It's difficult to find anything, any area that we can look to, to, to solidify that. And one of the things that we've done in London is to look at the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. This is probably the most universal document that any one of us can get a hold of. Probably the most universal document that any of us can look at. Look at the, Uni the, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and look at all the articles and compare them and see why is it that they're so attractive? Why is it that 126 nations have signed up to this declaration? You will find that almost all of them have biblical principles right through it. But there's an enormous amount of articles in there that Islam cannot adhere to. Look at Article 4 on slavery. There has never been an abolition movement in Islam that I know of. The abolition movements that we've had against slavery have been uniquely Christian. Look at Article Number 5. No cruel or degrading punishment is permitted. Yet you look at the hoodoo punishments that you're asking for that have been trying to be enacted in Islamic countries, the cutting off of hands, the stoning or the, or the flogging of, of, of for adultery. Article 7, 8 and 10, equality. Yet if you look at the Muslim law, you will see that there is not equality for non-Muslims in a Muslim context. Look at the dhimilas, look at the karaj tax. It is not equal. Article 16. Equality for marriage and divorce, but there is no equality for marriage and divorce in Islam. Not for the women. Article 18, freedom of thought, freedom, th freedom to change one's religion. This is anathema in Islam. It doesn't exist. You can change and become a Muslim, but you cannot leave Islam. Article 19, freedom of opinion and expression. Okay. The Bible gives has no censorship in it. It does not, it does not call at all for censorship. Yet you go to any Muslim country today and you cannot criticize the Prophet, you cannot criticize the book, the Quran. Look what's happening in Pakistan if you need some examples. Article 21, equal access. Will equal access be given to people, certainly in an Islamic state, if, 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 if this became an Islamic state? Would I as a Christian be able to participate in government? Will I have authority? Would I as a Christian be able to be a caliph? No. Democracy doesn't work. And this is what we're asking for. Why and can you, how is it that Islam is relevant for me as a student? How can it be relevant when I see so much of the examples of Islam? They tear at my skin. They tear at what I see that God had instituted for his people, not only back there in the Garden of Eden, but what we're going to be heading to in the next life. That should be evoked and that should be exemplified right here on earth. That's what I leave with you, Shabir. It'd be great to know if you have an answer for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I only have five minutes, and that doesn't give me enough time to read you Bible verses. But often I find the difficulty is that um, people see certain things in Islam and they say, well, no, that's very wrong. That's wrong. Our religion is not like that. Man, we got the Holy Bible. And, you know, the Holy Bible doesn't teach us things like that. What, can I, what would you do if I show you the blasphemy law also in the Bible? Did you know that if a son is a glutton, the Bible says you should kill him? You don't know the Bible says that if a man is having a fight with, an, with another man, and if his wife comes to his rescue by grabbing the groins of the other man, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 11, you should cut off her hand, show her no mercy. That's the Bible. Now, I know it is true that Christians today do not practice this. I know that it is true that Christians today do not have authority to put that into rule. They have neglected that portion of the Bible. The law of God, which according to James in the New Testament must still be obeyed. According to Jesus in the New Testament must still be obeyed. Every jot and tittle of it. Matthew chapter 5 verse 19 and 20. According to Jesus, every little commandment must be put into place. But I know Christians do not have authority anywhere in the world. And they do not put that into practice. This is true. What is ruling here in Britain? or in the United States of America or Canada, it's not Christianity. Yes, it has come from Christianity. It has grown actually out of Christianity. 
but it is secular humanism, not Christianity. But if we were to practice what is here in the Bible, people would have to be put to death more than they are put to death in, for, for reasons from the Qur'an. Because in the Qur'an we don't have that the son, if your son is a glutton, you must put him to death to you. Slavery, you say? You know, people have used the Bible to justify the, the holding of slaves in America up until very recently because the Bible shows you how to treat your slaves but it doesn't tell you that you should liberate them and in fact the Bible even tells slaves that they should remain as they are Paul speaking to slaves said if you're a slave remain as you are because Jesus is coming back anytime for in, on the clouds of heaven and he will scoop you up so remain as you are if you're married stay as you are if you're a virgin stay as you are don't get married because anytime now Jesus is gonna come back so Paul did not give any kind of ethic nor did they collect the ethics from Jesus on which a new ethical system can be built Muslims are taking their religion seriously and so they're looked upon in the world hey the Muslims are doing that and that's wrong but do you realize, folks, that it is in the Word of God, the Holy Bible, which you read? Now you say that's brutal. Can I tell you what's brutal? According to the, to the Old Testament, if you have a slave, and the slave gets married to a female slave of yours, and then they have children, when it comes the time for the slave to be released, if he had a contract with you to be released over a number of years, comes time for him to be released, if he is in love with the woman to whom he is married and he doesn't want to leave, he can come to you and say, I've decided to be your slave forever. And what you do in that case is you put him against the wall. And you take an awl. Do you know what is an awl? The thing you use to punch holes into leather. So you put him against the wall and get his ear up against the wall. Take the awl and punch a hole into his ear. And that will mark him as your slave for life. Folks, these are forgotten teachings in the Bible. I'm not saying that they're true teachings or false teachings. What I'm saying is that if these things are in the book which you call the Holy Bible, why do you point the finger at the Muslims and say, hey, look, you know, something is wrong there. So, folks, we have to know the scriptures. And this is what I've been saying tonight. We have to study. Paul said you cannot study this faith. This faith has to be revealed to you by a spirit from God. And then I ask Christians, then why do you come forward and try to explain to us what is the faith? If you say the faith cannot be understood by anyone if he doesn't have the spirit, first he will understand and then he will get the spirit. Or is it first he will get the spirit and then he will understand? How does this work, folks? So then, if it cannot be understood, why do you come and explain it? See, there's a problem here. And the problem again points to St. Paul. He introduced new doctrine, it was not making sense, and he said, just take it as it is. But Joseph knows, I know, that we have to explain the faith. And this is what we've been trying to do here tonight. It should be explainable, it should make sense at its fundamentals. Ladies and gentlemen, I was talking about the fundamental doctrines. Who is God exactly? And how does he repair himself to human beings? And what Joseph is speaking about are the branches of the religion. The finer points. So, it doesn't make much sense, you know, if we're losing ground on the main point, that we go to the finer ones. We should stick on the main point and accept what is being shown to us by the power of God Almighty today. And I thank God that he has given me the opportunity to speak before you. I thank you also for your patient listening. Um, now we're going to move to the uh, questions. We've got absolutely piles of questions here. Uh, so what we've done is um, we've grouped them together and uh, we've sort of passed them on to the speakers. And uh, I trust you'll read out the question and then answer it. Thank you. You've got five minutes and then Shabir Yusuf has, Shabir Ali has five minutes to reply. Okay, the question to uh, Joseph about the relationship of God with, with Adam. What was the nature of this relationship? Was it a son-father relationship? I think, I've already, I think I may have answered that already. I think it's very clear that it was, it was uh, not a relation to a son to a father, it was a relation to a creator to his created. Now we are called his children and, there are, and, and, and we must be careful that we don't look at that as a biological relationship. I think you in, in Arabic you have the same term when you look at uh, in uh, Surah 2, 177, you will see that it refers to the wayfarer as somebody is a son of the road, somebody who's a wayfarer, as somebody who's a son of the road. We don't assume that uh, a traveler or a wayfarer is somebody who's born of the road. No, it's a, it's, it's, it's a symbolic uh, usage in that context. But certainly the relationship that Adam had to, his, uh, to, the, to God was not as a son as, as, as we see when we're referring to the Son of God with the definite article, who is Jesus Christ, the only Son. Um, did, if Jesus was God, and if he did die on the cross, then who ran the work 
while he was dead. And I think this is the same question you brought up, uh, Shabir. And I've, and I've heard this question many times, and to me, it's, 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 in some ways, it's, it's rather an odd question, because I, don't, I think in, 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 in the respect that you have with the, with the, Holy, with the, with the Spirit of, of, of Allah, who is pervasive through the earth, who are, when the Spirit is on earth, when the Spirit is in your presence, certainly where is Allah at that time? And what do you do with Ru? The, the, the term Ru, what do you do with the Spirit? Certainly, no one has difficulty understanding that even though God, uh, even though the Son of God was on earth, and he died, that there would be any problem with, a, with the impairment of that relationship. The relationship still did exist. God still ruled. God still existed. That didn't mean that the God suddenly did not exist because the Son of God uh, died on the cross. I don't think that should be a real difficulty there. Has Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for people's sin, those who came and born later, or has he done this for everyone before and after him? If, uh, from what we see there, and I just read the scripture earlier, it, is, it, 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 it included all humanity. It didn't just include the people that came after. That's why you have all these prefigurements that were pointing to the time when that final sacrifice would coming, was coming. That's why you do have the blood sacrifice. That sacrifice included all humanity throughout history in, from the very beginning right to the end. And that's the, 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 the enormity of it and the fact that it's so significant for us today. And that's why we celebrate it in Easter um, every year uh, that happened 2,000 years ago. Why there isn't any gospel according to Jesus Christ? I think the reason for that question is a lot of is your view uh, as Muslims of what uh, a prophet is. A prophet must always have a scripture, and therefore you are you're trying to pigeonhole Jesus into that category. A uh, prophet must have a revelation, yes. A prophet must must give have a message from God, but not necessarily he, a prophet has to write something down. I don't know that Adam wrote anything down, yet you all believe that Adam was a prophet. I don't know anywhere that we can say many of the prophets. You have 126,000 prophets. Did they all write scriptures? No. We, in fact, we only have five scriptures that Islam points to that, 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 that are considered to be authoritative. So that should not be a problem. The, the, what, the, the, the difficulty that people have, and I think maybe what's behind this question, is that there's this view that Jesus Christ did write a, a, a scripture, but it got lost. And so therefore, the scriptures that we have today, um, since they're written in Greek, not Aramaic, Christ was spoken only in Aramaic, uh, therefore they must be much later gospels, they must be redacted back. Well, the answer to that, if that's what the questioner is trying to say, is that Jesus Christ did speak in Aramaic, but he also spoke in Greek. How did he speak to the rich centurion? How did he speak to the Samaritan woman there at the well in John 3? So therefore, to believe that Jesus Christ could only speak one language, I think is, is, um, is, is not correct. He certainly did speak, and that was his mother tongue was Aramaic, just like we're all speaking here in English today, because that's the tongue that we can all, that's the tongue that we all, uh, let, me, let me clarify that again. He spoke in Aramaic when he was teaching, but certainly when he was speaking to the people who were not Aramaic speaking, he changed to, to Greek, because that was the official language, that was the trade language of that period. English is the language that we all speak in common today, but every one of you probably, many of you, not everyone, you have other languages that you can speak at home and when you're talking amongst your friends. Do you believe Jesus... I, I don't know, the, uh, the writing's a bit difficult. Is it God? Do you believe Jesus is God or the Son of God or a prophet? Why would... Well, yeah. Well, I think the, the, the answer to that is, is obvious. I said, said it many times, and we've gone through numerous numbers of scriptures in Luke, Mark, where Christ himself we refers to himself as the Son of God, not a Son of God, the Son of God, and he's also a prophet. But he's more than a prophet. He's much, much more than a prophet. He came through a virgin birth. This is unique. To, to no, no one else came by via virgin birth. So in 1919, says in your own Quran that something was unique about Jesus. He never sinned. So there is a, there is a view here. We, we understand that he was a unique son of God, not just a prophet. Thank you. you have five minutes. What I like about this debate is so rapid fire, you know, we're back and forth to catch everything on the spot. Now, uh, folks, let me see if I can uh, deal with the questions very quickly about the sonship of Jesus. What, what kind of sonship was it? This indeed is the kind of question get, that gets raised once we... Uh, can I synchronize you exactly, what, five minutes? Four? Yeah? Okay. Now, I have four more? Four and a half. Four and a half, all right. <laughs> four and a... Have. Now, the sonship of Jesus, this is the kind of question that gets raised. What exactly was meant by saying that Jesus is the son of God? You see, if you have something and then someone else is the son of that something, then the someone would share the nature of that something. But if the nature of God is to be eternal and unlimited, then the son would also have the same nature of being eternal and unlimited. And then you would have two eternals and unlimited, and you're not supposed to have that according to the Old Testament. 
So these are the kind of problems that you have raised. Furthermore, and the question can be looked at from a different angle. And this ties in with the idea of the virgin birth. You see, many people think that the virgin birth of Jesus uh, seems to imply that he must have had God as his father. And the Quran replies to that by saying, He, God, is the one who forms you in the wombs of your mothers the way he wishes. Well, then, if you think about it, Jesus is there in the womb of his mother. He's growing as an embryo. Is he God at that time? Does he know that he's God? Is he conscious of being God? Does he know that he's actually running the Andromeda galaxy somewhere out there? So these are the kinds of questions that get raised. And if he doesn't, and indeed we see from the New Testament that Jesus was limited. He was limited in his knowledge. According to Mark chapter 12 verse 32, uh, or rather chapter 13 verse 32, he said, of that day and hour no one knows, not even the Son, but the Father only. Speaking of the day of judgment, Jesus said, if these are his words, that... He doesn't know when the day of judgment will occur. So, when he was in the womb of his mother, does he know that he is God? Is he conscious of that? During delivery, going, coming through all between, amidst all the blood and everything, does he know that he is God being drenched in, in blood of a woman? These are the kinds of things that, that should be asked. So what exactly is meant by sonship here? And then, you see, many people read in the New Testament that the virgin birth was announced to Mary in this way, that the angel came to her and said that the Holy Spirit, that when Mary asked, you know, how will this be? So she was told, the Spirit of the Most High will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will, will overshadow you. And so the th holy thing to be born in you will be called the Son of God. So many people understand that, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God because the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and overshadowed her in this graphic way that must be envisioned in their minds somehow. You can't escape it if you're reading the Gospel according to Luke. And then the common lay Christian thinks, well, yeah, that's how come Jesus is the Son of God. But if you ask the theologians, they will tell you, no, 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 that's not how Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was the Son of God from all eternity. He didn't become son of God at that point, you see. So you didn't need the virgin birth for that. If God wanted to come into the womb of a woman, he could have come into any woman, virgin or not. He doesn't need a virgin woman for that. And certainly you don't need the Holy Spirit to overshadow Mary. But the way it is written in the Gospel of Luke leads to a misunderstanding in the minds of people. People think that, yeah, you know, somehow God replaced the male agent in this relationship with Mary and produce this child. But this is a wrong understanding. Neither Muslims nor Christians should have that understanding. No. It's wrong to say that Jesus is a physical son of God. But then what sort of son is he? If he is the spiritual son of God from all eternity, what exactly is the proof for that? That proof has not been offered anywhere. When Jesus died on the cross, who ruled the world? Well, we looked at this question before. Well, we look at it again. Truly, he was dead on the cross, and you say he was God. Well, then if he died, look what happens. There is a change in the Godhead. You say there were three. One of them died. Is there no change in the Godhead? Well, if the other two maintain the full Godhead without the third one, that means the third one is dispensable. And if he didn't die, really, that means it's just a charade. He didn't really die. He just appeared to die to the people. But, you know, he's appearing to do... You see, the whole story, folks, is a kind of... I don't know how to put this. Imagine yourself that you're a painter. You have to paint this whole floor. 30 seconds, wow. You know, you start at one corner and you end up at the door so you can exit. But if you're a foolish person, you paint all around and leave yourself in the middle and then you ask, how can I get out of here? Send me a rope down from the top. And it seems that God was caught into a corner. He didn't know what to do. The solution is simpler than that. He knew what to do. He forgives the sins of people. Now I have five minutes to answer my own set of questions. <laughs> okay, so the first one is drop the floor. Bible makes references to prophets who, commit, who committed sins. Uh, can, we, uh, can we base our faith and our lives on the words of sinners? Well, this is, a, this is a question too. I mean, if the Bible shows us that these heroic figures were committing sins, then the average person is going to say, you know, I know the temptation is calling me out there, and, uh, you know... I don't feel like doing it. I want to do the right thing. But, you know, somebody like David did it. So why not me? You see? But if you read in your Holy Scripture that the figures who should be respected and loved and, and, and used as your models, if they were holy persons in the sense that they didn't go after these major sins, like the way they're described in the Bible, well, then you have a more positive outlook. You have a better chance of living a moral life yourself. You are what you read, the saying goes, or what you eat, no? 
so it is, it is more psychologically healthy and religiously uh, pleasing if you can read in your scriptures that the prophets did not commit the types of sins that are reported of them in the Old Testament. And this is why I'm happy that God gave us the Quran, because the Quran tells us that all these people were righteous persons, like David, that he was from the righteous person. And you can see this even in the Bible. I mean, how come the Bible says that David committed all these heinous crimes? Like, you know, he, he saw a woman bathing, he took her into his house because he couldn't resist her, and then the woman's husband was out in the army. So, you know, he had the man called back. Because after he had a relationship with the woman, he's worried about the news that will spread. So he had the man called back to go and spend the night with his wife. But when the man came back, he said, no, sorry, David, I can't go enjoy my time with my wife because, you see, my comrades are out there in the battlefield getting their, you know, putting their lives in danger. I can't go to my wife. He said, I'm gonna, just going to spend the night here in the palace. So David, you know, was losing. So the man had to go back to the battle, and David sent a letter with his um, first man in charge saying, put this man in the front line of the battle to make sure he gets killed. You see, so now he took the woman and then, you know, arranged for the death of the woman's husband. And then the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And in Hebrews chapter 11 names him as one of those persons of whom the earth was not worthy. So you see, David was a righteous man. And this is what the Quran does in fact bring out. But sometimes things crept into the Bible that uh, perhaps should not have been there in the, in the book of God. Who in Judaism, that's the next question, who in Judaism, I better be quick here now. Is the sin transferred to the goat? Uh, oh, in Judaism, the sin is transferred to the goat. In Christianity, sin is transferred to the Son of God. In Islam, where is the sin transferred? Uh, folks, sin is not something that really exists there as a monster somewhere that has to go somewhere. Symbolically, the Jewish people were putting their sins on the goat, and they can feel satisfied, you know, it's going. In Christianity, people have the same satisfaction, you know, it is going there. In Islam, I feel we have the right understanding that it doesn't have to go somewhere. Sin is disobedience of God. Even the Bible says that sin is lawlessness. So what you have to do is repair yourself to God by asking for Him to forgive you. It's not something physical, although it has been personalized in the past. It doesn't have to go anywhere, and God does not have to demand a price for it from anyone. He just simply forgives it, because He loses nothing. However, if we wrong another human being, we have to repay the human being and then seek forgiveness also from God. About... Uh, Abraham, it seems to say, do you subscribe to the Jewish view that although God said you will surely die and then changes his mind? Well, this, this does not really mean that God changed his mind. You see, God can give a maximum penalty. If you read in the book of Deuteronomy, for example, that God says to the Jewish people, all kinds of horrible things are going to happen to them if they don't keep the law. And you know yourself, they didn't keep the law because the, Bi the Bible says they were like a backsliding heifer. You ever tried to pull a backsliding heifer up a slope? Huh? cow, you know, if your cow keeps going back, you keep pulling and keep going back, it's sliding. God says the Israelite nation was like that. They didn't keep his commandment. And yet he didn't give them the kind of punishments that are, that are there in the, in the Bible. So he didn't change his mind. He gives a maximum penalty. That's his threat. He will do up to that, but no more. Actually, the, my understanding is a better one because this shows that God gave a threat and didn't do the full threat. If you say that God threatened death and then afterwards he gave even more penalties to Adam, you know, now in addition to death, the woman has to also suffer in childbearing, the man also has to work for a living and so on. Well, that's doing more than what he said he would do. And that, you know, it's not really right. Like, you know, your professor says, if you do such and such a thing, this is the penalty. And then he says, no, 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 I changed my mind. Double penalty. It's not going to work. I thank you very much. Okay. Um, yeah, you have 10 minutes in which you can reply to Shibir Ali's and points and oh, I'm sorry, I was reading the questions while he was talking. You think 10 minutes? Yeah. All right, well, let me just continue on with the questions. I think we'll go ahead with that, since this is what, where the people are itching. Um, question about St. Barnabas' gospel. This is a, an evidence. As St. Barnabas was alive at the time of Jesus, he said uh, in the, 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 that Jesus said, I am the Son of God, and prophesied the coming of our prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Why? Has his gospel been disregarded in the Bible after all it is an evidence and most one of the most accurate? If you get onto our website, and I'm going to put it up here if you want to get onto it, it's, it's, we're going to be putting up a rebuttal to the Gospel of Barnabas in just a few weeks. Uh, basically, what I can say right now, so that you can follow, it's this, it's this red uh, marking here. Basically, with the Gospel of Barnabas, there's a lot of problems with the Gospel of Barnabas. First of all, you'll see that whoever wrote the Gospel of Barnabas had not lived in Palestine. Because in the Gospel of Barnabas, it says that Nazareth, which is in the mountains, is actually on the, the Sea of Capernaum. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, I'm sorry. And the Capernaum, which is on the Sea of Galilee, is, exists up in the mountains. 
way where Nazareth existed. So they got the two towns mixed up. Barnabas certainly would have known the difference. There's a lot of other problems as well. We can see from the Gospel of Barnabas that it talks about barrels, that the barrels were used to uh, store the wine. Barrels were not invented until the 10th century, not in, in Palestine, but in Europe. There's a lot of other difficulties. You've got, I won't go into them all right now. But if you can see, certainly what we do know is that, and, and, and we can almost place and know when it was written, it was written about the 13th century. The reason why is because it refers to the year of Jubilee as being 100 years. Well, everybody knows the year of Jubilee is 50 years, but there was one time in history when the year of Jubilee was made 100 years, and that was, I think, is that, um, is it Boniface II? Have I got that right? Pope Boniface II or Pope Pius II it was the one that dictated that in around this 13th century. So whoever wrote the Gospel of Barnabas, more than likely wrote it in the 13th century, not in Palestine, but somewhere in Europe. More than likely it was in Italian, because the original manuscripts that we have were written in Italian, and uh, were translated. And even the person who did the translation uh, considered it to be, uh, uh, in the, in the Ford, considered it to be a forgery. But that is not included in the Gospel of Barnabas that you'll buy at your Muslim book bookstore. Could you explain clearly enough the concept of the Trinity to be able to convince me? Wow. Um, <laughs> We're, we, we, we need to do a whole debate on the Trinity, I think. And I think, Shabir and I, you and I would be good if we could plan that and have a debate just on the Trinity. It would be great because it comes up over and over again. And we can't do it justice in just five minutes or even ten minutes or even in one afternoon. But certainly, the, the only way I, I cannot convince you about the uh, Trinity, but I will ask you a question and see if you can answer this. If you believe God, or if I was to ask you what is one of the qualities of God, and if I were to ask you is one of those qualities the, the, uh, uh, of God love, and I were to ask you, what is the definition of love? I would hope you would say that love means, or probably the best definition of love is doing for the other, doing something for the other at the owner's expense. By definition, love requires an object, does it not? Otherwise, it's just self-love. It becomes self-gratification. It becomes one's ego. Love, by its very definition, requires another. If God is love, where did love come from if he had no other, if he had no other by which he could express it upon. If God is only one dimensional as we see in Islam, if God is only one dimensional, then where was the other love? Where was the other to express that love since the beginning of creation? I can only understand love when I look at the Trinity. Because there I see from the time, from the very beginning, before creation, before, from, well there is no word for it because God never was created, but from time eternal if time can be measured. God has always loved, and that is why we know love today, and that is why we have seen the greatest example of love in God sending His Son, coming down, and sacrificing Himself for us on the cross. There it is exemplified, and there we have the model for ourselves. Now I know why is it I love my son, and I know why is it my son loves me back. I know where it came from. I know that it had to be originated. It had to have come from the heart of God. I knew it had to have come from the God in himself. But I cannot see that in an Islamic God. Not only that, I don't see it exemplified in an Islamic God. Where has God ever exemplified love like that? Sacrificing himself for his created. Love that I exemplify today. I would be willing to sacrifice myself for my son. Where did that originate but from the Godhead? That had to originate it from the Godhead. I can't explain it to you. I can't to convince you of that, obviously. There's no way that I can really convince you of that. But walk that through and work that through and see if that makes sense to you. That's also on the Trinity. Um, you say something went wrong in the garden. This suggests God didn't know what was going to happen. And his creation was able to disrupt his plan. Far from it. God did know this was going to happen. God certainly knew what was going to happen. But God knew, in, in, in knowing that this was going to happen, he, did, he let it happen nonetheless. Why? Because he knew that in order for us to have that freedom which he has, in order for us who are made in his image, to have the freedom to choose between right and wrong, to be able to choose to reject or accept him, Knowing that we were going to do that, he knew that we were going to reject him, he knew that we were going to have to pay for that, that we were going to have to be thrown out and be, uh, uh, that relationship was going to be lost. He knew also that that, was, that that same sin, that same broken relationship was going to be repaired. So the two go hand in hand. He knew that this, that what, what our decision was going to be, but he also knew that he was going to be the one that would have to pay and redeem us back to himself, buy us back a second time doesn't suggest at all that his plan was disrupted. It suggests that everything that we, that shows the enormity of what God has given to us, and that is he's given us the same choice made in his image that he has. When Jesus said that all food is clean, and how come the Holy Spirit said that once, that once some fastest, 
some food is unclean. Okay. Um, you need to go to Acts 10. Let me back up. Why is it that there seems to be, to, in, in, I guess behind this, this whole question is, why is it that there seems to be one revelation uh, in the ex uh, Levitical account and another revelation in the, in the New Testament account? Why is it that there's one law for the Jews, and you were referring to this, that uh, they, they seem to be bar very barbaric laws in the beginning, and that there is a different law there in the New Testament? Christ seemed to bring about a new law. See? And what we see in Acts 10, where these unclean foods that were, came down in the vision, if you have a chance, go and read Acts 10. There for Peter, uh, Peter seen this vision at, at uh, Cornelius' house. And Christ and, and God saying to him, why, why do you not eat these unclean animals that were in that sheet that were coming down? And Peter says, I've never eaten these animals because they are unclean. As a good Jew, I know I can't eat these unclean animals. And God says, why do you say this is unclean for those, uh, when, I, when you know that I say that they are clean? Now, what's going on here? Why two different revelations? Why does this seem to contradict what we see very much earlier in the Levitical account? I think the easiest way to explain that is to understand what we, talk of, what we call progressive revelation. What we mean by that is that if you look at the Levitical account, if you look at what's happening right through the swath of the history in the, New, in the Old and New Testament, you will see that God is working with his people. He is working with his people who are in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Egypt for in those not hundreds of years and bringing them out uh, under Moses' leadership and bringing out them into, into the desert. He finds that there's an enormous amount of sin still in, involved in it. They're still praying to gods. They were still using idols. In fact, it was idols they used to build this golden calf. They still had an enormous amount of Egypt still in them. And it's much like my family, getting back to my family again, it's much like my two boys. I have an 11-year-old and I have a 7-year-old. My 11-year-old I have certain rules and regulations for, but my 7-year-old I have a lot more rules and regulations because he's a lot younger. He's a lot more immature. He needs a lot more rules and regulations. I don't let my 7-year-old go on a bus in London, under, uh, on the London uh, bus company. I let my 11-year-old go on a bus. Why is that? Is it because I'm being unfair to one or the other? No, because my 11-year-old is a lot more mature. And God works with his people through history the same way. We see what he did with the Israelites had to be done because they had enough, a lot of the world still in them. And God had to put up in parameters, rules and regulations to make sure that as he was wooing them back unto himself, that they knew exactly what those boundaries were. But then another 1,700 years later, he did, those, the, the, the Jews no longer needed those rules and regulations. He didn't need those, they didn't need those rules and regulations because they now had the scriptures. They now had, the, 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 they, they now had retrospect. They can look back at the history and see how God had used and worked with them all the way through those 1,700 years. The new law that God now put into their hearts, we see that in Jeremiah 30, 31, 31, prophesying that God would now place that law into their hearts. This new law was now being evoked and being, being uh, uh, stimu stimulated by the Holy Spirit. And we see this in John 16, where it says, I will send you a comforter, not the paraclete, not the, the glorious one, as many Muslims think it is. It's the paraclete is the Holy Spirit. It says so right there in, in John 14, John 16, which we, now, which we see fulfilled in Acts 1.8. It is this Holy Spirit, thanks. It is this Holy Spirit then that now convicts. It is this Holy Spirit that now directs. It's this Holy Spirit that now directs each one of us who have been redeemed so that we know now what is right and wrong we don't need we know now what we don't need all these boundaries and blue rules and regulations we are now much more mature and even more so 2,000 years down the line and that's the same way we work with our children it's the same way that God works with his children I think that's the easiest way to explain that here's the same question again um, if we are made in God's in the image of God does that mean that God's weak Woof. Um, certainly, I would not hope that people looking at... Oh, do I have time to get into this? <laughs> no. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can I just explain? Um, this is the final five minutes, so if you could just remain seated. After this, it's all ending. Inshallah, God willing. What do I have? Five minutes for questions or five minutes to reply or both? Both. Just five. Okay. Five total. Five in total? Yeah. Okay. All right, in five in total, I've got to be really quick. First reply, Gospel of Barnabas, we must reject it, uh, Smith tells us, because there are mistakes in the Gospel of Barnabas. I don't think this is a sufficient reason for rejecting the Gospel of Barnabas. Mind you, I didn't say this is the Word of God, this is the true Gospel. But I'm saying that we cannot reject it out of hand just because it's got mistakes, because, on the other hand, the four Gospels also have mistakes. Less mistakes are there in the Gospel according to Mark, but this one also has mistakes. For example, Mark says that when Jesus was coming on the, ro on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, he passed by Bethpage and Bethany, whereas it actually is the reverse. If you're coming from the road to Jericho, you come to Bethany first and then Bethpage, but Mark apparently did not know this. You can read about this in Mark chapter 11. Then, 
Again, in Mark, we are told that uh, Herod was uh, unhappy with uh, John the Baptist and what he preached because Herod has, had taken his brother's Philip's wife. And uh, actually, historians have found out it wasn't his brother Philip's wife, but his brother Bothus's wife. Bothus, not Philip. So there are mistakes also in the Gospels of a historical nature. Luke also made a mistake about Quirinius. He said that a census took place in the, age, in the time of Quirinius. But we also read in the Gospels that Jesus was born during the reign of Herod. And the two times do not match by 10 years. They're off. So either Luke has got it wrong or Matthew has got it wrong. There is a mistake, but we don't reject the Gospels outright because of that. We should still study them and see what information they can bear on the life and teachings of Jesus. The Trinity. How do we explain the Trinity? Ladies and gentlemen, there's no explanation that makes sense concerning the Trinity. People have tried. Uh, this one about God is love. I, I think this is really futile thinking. Let me explain why. You see, you can ask all kinds of questions about God. You can ask, you know, is God powerful enough to build a stone so big that he, even he can't lift it? Huh? You know, you can ask all kinds of questions. But what's left for Muslims and Christians to do is to go back to the original message. What did Jesus preach? Did he preach that God is one in three? Anywhere. Can you find me the words of Jesus anywhere in the Bible? He said, I am God, worship me. Or he said, God is one in three or three in one? No. According to Mark chapter 12, verse 27, when he was asked about this, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. He said, This is the greatest of all the commandments. The man who asked him about this said to him, You're right, teacher. You're right in saying that there is only one God, and besides him there is no other. And Jesus praised the man for his right thinking and discernment. So that's the message that Muslims and Christians should both adopt, instead of speculating. Otherwise we can say, you know, God is love, but where was the love? You know, okay, so God created the heavens and the earth, but where was God before he created the heavens and the earth? Men and women, Muslims and Christians do not ask these questions. But Muslims and Christians follow the scriptures as was revealed to them. God in the garden, was he omniscient? Folks, unfortunately, the story as it is given in, in the in the um, book of Genesis, shows God to unfortunately not know everything. Now, uh, Smith raised the point, why doesn't Shabir speak about the Quran here? Uh, folks, the Quran is not the problem. The problem we're discussing, you know, we're looking at what needs to be corrected. <laughs> you see, no, please don't laugh. Uh, you know, because we need to understand this, not to one community laugh at the other, but both community with love should share their thoughts and understanding and try to understand this together. Why are we discussing something? Because there's something that needs to be corrected in the understanding of people. I mean, if you read the book of Genesis, you get the impression that first of all, in chapter one, God created everything. He saw that everything was good. Then by chapter... Then by chapter 6, you find that God is taken almost by surprise. Because now everything is not good. God is fed up with the sins of human beings. He said, my heart will not put up with them forever. Because from morning till night, their inclinations are all towards evil. So God said, I'm going to limit their years to 120 years. But even that didn't stop people from committing evil. Then God decided, I'm going to wipe them all out with the flood of Noah. Then after that, people are just as bad as before. So one commentator on the Bible says, it seems that God is trying everything possible to reform man and it's not working. So God is not trying, ladies and gentlemen, but that's the impression you would get from the Bible. No, God knows everything in advance. He's not in that limited form, but somehow the authors of the Bible perceived of him in that form, like a big superhuman being, a man in the sky. And so this is how they wrote concerning him. But the God of the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews transcends that. And we want both Muslims, Christians and Jews to understand that about the one all-powerful unseen God, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much.